Welcome back to episode 23 of our podcast. Last time we finished thinking about early music and finished off the early Baroque period. And today we're going to start looking at the late Baroque period. So let's jump in. Music from the period of approximately 1600 to 1750 is usually referred to as Baroque, a term that is borrowed from art history. Art historians themselves borrowed the term from 17th century jewelers who applied it to large pearls of irregular shape. At one time, then, Baroque art was considered imperfect, bizarre, or at best erratic. With changing taste over the centuries, however, what was originally a negative implication has turned positive. And over the last 70 years, with the help of recordings, Baroque music has grown more and more popular. Instruments of the period have been revived to play it, among them the harpsichord, the recorder, and a special high-pitched trumpet. More, most of the Baroque music heard today dates from the 18th century, from around 1700 to 1750, a sub-period sometimes classified as the late Baroque. Johann Sebastian Bach and George Friedrich Handel were the greatest composers of this period, and among their most important contemporaries were Alessandro Scarlatti and Antonio Vivaldi in Italy, François Couperin and Jean-Philippe Rameau in France, and Domenico Scarlatti of Spain, and George Philip Telemann in Germany. So let's discuss absolutism in the age of science. Baroque is a period term used by art historians and musicologists. Historians are more likely to speak of the period from 1600 to 1750 as the age of absolutism, a time when the doctrine of the divine right of kings endured the absolute rule of God-chosen monarchs. So this was the idea that monarchs were put into these positions by God. This was the time when Louis XIV of France became the most powerful and praised monarch in all of European history and also one of the most ruthless. The pomp and splendor of his court were emulated by a host of lesser kings and nobles. Students of the history of ideas, on the other hand, speak of this age as the age of science. In this era, the telescope and the microscope revealed their first secrets. Newton and Leibniz invented calculus. Newton developed his laws of mechanics and the theory of gravity. These discoveries stimulated both technology and philosophy. Not only the formal philosophy of the great empiricist thinker Descartes, Locke, and Hume, but also philosophy in a more informal sense. People began to think about ordinary matters in a new way, affected by the newly acquired habits of scientific experimentation and proof. The mental climate stimulated by science significantly affected the art and the music we call Baroque. Absolutism and science were just two of the most vital currents that defined life in the 17th and early 18th centuries. The result was an interesting dualism that can be traced throughout Baroque art. Dualism of pomp and extravagance on one hand, system and calculation on the other. The same dualism can be traced in Baroque music. Art and absolutism. Though there'd always been royalty in Europe who practiced the art of peace as well as the arts of war, sponsorship of the arts rose to new heights in the Baroque era. In earlier years, 
The artistic glories of the Renaissance were fostered by powerful merchant princes, such as the Medici family in Florence, who were determined to add luster to the city-states they ruled. But never before the 17th century did one state loom so large in Europe as did France under Louis XIV from 1638 to 1715, the so-called Sun King. All of French life orbited around the royal court, like planets, comets, and cosmic dust in the solar system. Pomp and ceremony were carried to extreme lengths. The king's levee, his getting up in the morning right, involved dozens of functionaries and routines lasting two hours. Artists of all kinds were supported lavishly so long as their work symbolized the majesty of the state and the state, in Louis' famous remark, is me. The influence of this monarch and his image extended far beyond France, for other European princes and dukes envied his absolute rule and did everything they could do to match it, especially in Germany, which was not a united country like France, but a patchwork of several hundred political units. Rulers vied with one another in supporting artists who built, painted, and sang to their glory. Artistic life in Europe was kept alive for many generations by this sort of patronage, and the brilliance and grandeur of Baroque art derives from its soci sociological function. Art was to impress, even to stupefy. Thus, Louis XIV built the most enormous palace in history, Versailles with over 300 rooms, including the 80-yard-long Hall of Mirrors, the great formal gardens extending for miles. Many nobles and prelates built little imitation Versailles palaces, among them the Archbishop of Würzburg, whose magnificent residence was built in Bach's lifetime. The rooms were decorated by the Venetian artist Giovanni Battista Tiepolo, a master of Baroque ceiling painting. Looking up at the ceiling shown here and try to imagine its true dimensions, we are dazzled by figures in excited motion, caught up in the great gusts of wind that whirl them out of their architectural space. Ceiling paintings provides a vivid example of the extravagant style inside of Baroque dualism. The music of absolutism. Just as painting and architecture could glorify rulers through color and designs extending through space, music could glorify by sound extending through time. The nobility demanded horn players for their ceremonial hunts, trumpeters for their battles, and orchestras for balls and entertainment. They required smaller groups of musicians for tafel music or table music, background music for their lengthy banquets, a special celebratory or festive orchestra featuring military instruments like trumpets and drums was used to pay homage to kings and princes. By extension, it also glorified God, the King of Kings, as he is called in Handel's Hallelujah Chorus. The words sung by the chorus in this famous work praise God, but the accompanying orchestra also plays splendid hom homage to King George II of England, which we'll talk about in the future. The main musical vehicle of Baroque absolutism was opera. Opera today is an expensive entertainment in which a drama is presented with music and elaborate stage spectacle. So it was in the Baroque era as well. The stage set shown here was created by a member of the Bibiana family, foremost set designers of the time. It conveys the majestic heights and distances of an ideal Baroque palace by means of perspective 
through the stage was actually quite shallow. The figures gesture grandly, but they are dwarfed by pasteboard architecture that seems to whirl as dizzily as does the painted architecture on Tiopolo's ceiling. One aspect of Baroque opera is unlike opera today. The stories were allegorical tributes to the glory and supposed virtue of those who paid for them. In one favorite Baroque opera story, for example, the Roman Emperor Titus survives a complicated plot on his life and then magnanimously forgives the plotters. This story was set to music by dozens of different court composers. It told courtiers that if they opposed their king, he might well excuse them out of the godlike goodness of his heart, for he claimed to rule by divine right. But it also reminded them that he was an absolute ruler, a modern Roman tyrant who could do exactly the reverse if he pleased. Operas flattered princes while at the same time stressing their power and, not incidentally, their wealth. Opera was invented in Italy around the year 1600. Indeed, opera counts as Italy's great contribution to the 17th century's golden age of theater. This century saw Shakespeare and his followers in England, Corneille and Racine in France, and Lope de Vega and Calderon in Spain. The very term theatrical suggests some of the extravagance and exaggeration we associate with the Baroque. But the theater is first and foremost a place where strong emotion is on display and it was this more than anything else that fluid fueled the Baroque fascination with the theater. The emotionality that we generally sense in Baroque art has a theatrical quality. This is true even of much Baroque paintings. Compare Raphael's calm Renaissance Madonna with the early Baroque Madonna by Caravaggio. The pilgrim at the front is almost falling forward. The virgin, deeply moved, cranes her neck in response to him. The whole dramatic scene is highlighted by sharply focused, stagely illuminations. Science and the Arts all this may seem some distant away from the observatories of Galileo and Kepler and the laboratories where Harvey discovered the circulation of the blood and Leeuwenhoek first viewed microorganisms through a microscope. And indeed, the scientific spirit of the time had its most obvious effect on artists who were outside the realm of absolutism. The Dutch were citizens of free cities, not subjects of despotic kings. In Jan Vermeer's painting of his own city, Delft, the incredibly precise depiction of details reflects the new interest in scientific observation. The painter's analysis of light is worthy of Huygens and Newton, fathers of the science of optics. There is something scientific, too, in the serene objectivity of this scene. Man's control over nature is also symbolized by Baroque formal gardens. Today, landscape architecture is not usually regarded as one of the major arts, but it was very important in the age of the Baroque palace. Baroque gardens regulate nature strictly according to geometrical plans. Bushes are clipped, lawns are tailored, and streams channeled, all under the watchful eye of big statues of Venus, Apollo, Hercules, and the rest lined up in rows. Such gardens spell out the new vision of nature brought to heal by human reason and calculation. <laughs> 
Below the surface, furthermore, science is at work in even the most grandiose and dazzling of Baroque artistic efforts. The perspective of Tiepolo's ceiling paintings or Bibiana's stage set depends on the use of very sophisticated geometry. Bibiana published a manual detailing the mathematics behind his scene design even. This dual influence on extravagance and scientism of the splendid and the schematic can also be traced in Baroque music. So how did science and music interact? Various aspects of Baroque music reflect the new scientific attitudes that developed in the 17th century. Scales were tuned or tempered more precisely than ever before so that for the first time all possible keys were available to composers. Their interest in exploring this resource is evident from collections of pieces in all the 24 major and minor keys, such as Bach's The Well-Tempered Clavier. Harmony was systemized so that chords followed one another in a more logical and functional way. Regularity became the ideal in rhythm and in musical form. The distribution of selections of music and time. We find a tendency toward clearly ordered, even schematic plans. Whether consciously or not, composers seem to have viewed musical time in a quasi-scientific way. They divided it up and filled it systematically, almost in the spirit of the landscape architects who devised Baroque formal gardens. In the important matter of musical expression, too, Science was a powerful influence. Starting with the philosopher-mathematician René Descartes, thinkers applied the new rational methods to the analysis and classification of human emotions. It had always been felt that music was a special power to express and arouse emotion. Now it seemed that there was a basis for systematizing, and hence maximizing this power. Thus, scientifically inclined music theorists compiled checklists of musical devices and techniques corresponding to each of the emotions. Grief, for example, was projected with a specific kind of melodic motive and a specific kind of rhythm, even with a specific key. By working steadily with these devices and saturating their pieces with them, composers believed they could achieve the maximum musical expressivity. So you might be a little curious what the musical life in the early 18th century was. Well, the 18th century was a great age for the crafts, the age of Chippendale and furniture making, Wedgwood in pottery, and Silbermans in organ building, to name just a few. Though attitudes were changing, composing music was also regarded as a craft. The romantic idea of the composer, the lonely genius working over each masterpiece as a long labor of love expressing an individual personality, was still far in the future. Baroque composers were more likely to think of themselves as servants with masters to satisfy. They were artisans with jobs rather than artists with a calling, and they produced music on demand to fill a particular requirement. This is why many Baroque pieces seem relatively anonymous, as it were. They are not so much unique masterpieces as satisfactory examples of their style and genre, of which there are many other equally satisfactory examples. There were three main institutions where composers could make a living by practicing their craft. In order of increasing glamour, these were the church, the court, and the opera house. <laughs> 
For the church, in cathedrals, monasteries, and larger town churches of the Baroque era, the general assumption was that the organist or choir masters would compose their own music, as well as play and conduct. Organists had to improvise or write out music to accompany solemn places in the ritual and play along pieces to see the congregation out at the end of the service. At large institutions, important occasions called for elaborate music scored for chorists, soloists, and instruments. A Catholic mass for the installation of an archbishop or a Lutheran church cantata for the anniversary of the Reformation. Church musicians were also responsible for training the boys who sang in the choirs, often in special choir schools. Then there was the court. Under the patronage of kings or members of lesser nobility, a musician was employed on the same terms as a court painter, a master of the hunt, or a head chef. Though musicians had to work entirely at the whim of their masters, they could nevertheless count on a fairly secure existence, a steady demand for their services, and a pension. Naturally, conditions varied from court to court, depending on the ruler's taste. For some, music was a good deal less interesting than hunting or banqueting. Others could not have enough of it. Frederick the Great of Prussia was an enthusiastic amateur flutist, so at his court, the court concertos and sonatas for flute were composed at an especially healthy rate. Court musicians kept in better touch with musical developments than church musicians, since they were required to travel with their employers. There were extended trips, sometimes, to major cities where diplomacy was eased along by the music they composed for the occasion. And then finally, the opera house. Although many opera houses were attached to courts, others were maintained by entrepreneurs in major cities. The public opera house existed before the public concert hall. In the Baroque era, Public concerts were not a regular feature of musical life as they are today. Audiences were alert to the most exciting new singers, and it was part of the composer's job to keep the singers well supplied with music that showed off their talents. Composers traditionally conducted their own operas sitting at the harpsichord. The revival of an older opera usually because a favorite singer liked his or her part in it, was nearly always the occasion for massive recomposition because another singer might want her part redone too. If the opera's original composer had moved to the next town, other musicians would have no hesitation about rewriting or replacing the music. It was an exciting, unpredictable life promising great rewards as well as humiliating reverses. The life stories of the two greatest composers of the late Baroque period show a good deal about the interaction between musicians, the patrons who supported them, and the institutions that required music. Johann Sebastian Bach labored as a church organist, a church musician, and then a major composer administrator for the Lutheran Church. George Friedrich Handel, who also had a court position, became a leading opera composer and opera promoter. We'll learn more about them in the future. And we'll leave that there for today. I'm sorry that this episode did not come with any listening examples. This will also be the case for our next episode as we talk about um, different features of Baroque music before we start to focus in on Baroque instrumental music and then we'll come back to our listening examples. Thanks so much. We'll see you next time. Cheers. <laughs>